the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away as wounds which mother sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Was Hey guys, so just in case you're wondering, it's us, the Owens. Good morning, church. I'm Molly Owens. This is Tyler Owens. Hey guys. There's Luke Owens. And soon to be already here, but not quite out yet, Lucy Owens. She'll hopefully be with us actually when you view this video on Sunday morning. And yes, we're having a baby. A baby! So it's Tuesday when we're filming. She should be here by then. We wanted to spend this time with you before we go on maternity leave and um, have an offering thought for you. So Tyler will have that. And we just want to say we love you, church. We're grateful for you. And we're really excited to reconnect as our family gets larger and we return. Turn your Bibles to John 3, 16. You know, it says in John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God gives. He is the ultimate giver. And this morning, as we think about giving our offering, what we're considering, what's on the table, is what we'll give back to God. You know, that God gave his son ultimately paints God as a great giver that God gives to us, and it says he gave out of a heart of love, that he gave to us because he loves us. His gift to us 
is a testimony of his love for us. And he didn't just give anything. He didn't just give some white elephant gift, right? He, he gave to us the most precious thing that he had to give, and that was Jesus Christ. And as we consider this morning um, how we give back to God, consider what he gave to us, right? What is that gift worth to you? You know, if, if life were a white elephant exchange, he would have traded away Jesus in order to possess us. I think about how God gave us so much. What he gave us is worth everything. And really all he asks in return is not much at all. Whatever we give this morning, it really doesn't amount to paying him back. No one could do that. No one could amount to pay him back for what he's done for us. God gave us an amazing gift. And we're made in his image. We are his image bearers. And so you better believe if our maker was a giver, he did make us in his image to give back. And church, you guys have been so generous, so faithful with your giving. Um, I'm talking to the choir here, a church that is just really excels in giving. And so I'm so grateful to be a part of a church like that. I'm so grateful to give alongside of a church like that. But I think always keeping in the forefront of our mind that we were made to give. We were made by a giver in his image to be givers ourselves. Jesus is God. <laughs> Jesus is God's gift. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like presents? Yes. And so as we think about Jesus, the gift God gave to us that sets the standard for what giving is all about, let's consider what we might give back to God this morning. You know, here's a thought as we expect our child in just a couple hours here, 48 hours or so, um, we'll likely be holding our child. One of the dreams you have when you're having a kid is what are they going to look like? You know, I don't know if any of you guys ever, ever uploaded your photos into a baby generator where you, you um, put both photos and you try to see what's my child possibly going to look like. It's always a fun exercise. Um, but really, in all seriousness, you look like your father when you give. As you give this morning, just consider you really do look like your father. And I pray that our hearts are just as generous um, as God was with us. And with that, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much this morning to be able to give to you. I thank you for the precious gifts you give in our lives. Um, we're so grateful, God, just to have eternal life, just to be called your son, your daughter. That's more than enough. We could never repay you. And yet this morning, God, we offer a little of what you've entrusted with us back to you as a surrendered heart to say you're going to provide, God. You're going to multiply the blessings in our life hundredfold. And if not in this life, especially in the next life. But I thank you, God, for what you've given to us just for being a part of your church, just for being your children. For this, we're truly grateful. And with that, we give our offering. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would just like to share a few announcements about what's coming up in our church at this time. Last week we had our missions service and Tyrone Marcus did an incredible job preaching. Uh, he's from Trinidad. If you didn't 
get a chance to be able to be with us for that message, you can go to YouTube and watch it. And I do encourage you to do that to catch on up. But our season of giving has really opened up with uh, the missions offering. We have a goal of $196,000 this year, and we'll be giving it on April 25th. But I know many of us give early. We all have different ways of raising that money. Some of us give it a little bit every Sunday up until that date. Some give it all on that date. However you do it, let's just be praying about it and let's be giving to God and just see what he's going to be doing with us this year with our missions offering. Something I'd like you to save the date for, for our small group leaders, we're going to be having a leaders meeting on Zoom, Saturday, February 6th. It's going to be at 4 p.m. And that's with all the small group leaders in the church. What an encouraging time it is. I really do want to lift up our small group leaders. They've done an amazing job just keeping us together during the pandemic and helping us to, to learn Zoom uh, at the small group leader level. But this is going to be a great time just to hear great news from the different regions and also learn some things, just how to be more effective small group leaders. So save that date. It's going to be a great time together. Our theme this year is one. January, we've been focusing on the body. Today will be the final message for the body. And next month, February 7th, we're going to kick off One Spirit. Uh, what, a, what a great focus for us to be able to focus on the Holy Spirit. Uh, I hope that you can join us on YouTube for this. But I, I really do look forward to this part of our theme. At this time, we're going to go to our regions. So you can click on one of the links below if you want to join the teens, college, tribe, ministry, or one of our regions that you see there. If you're visiting with us today, click on one of these links to, to continue to be with us, or you can stay online right here. Marcus Overstreet will be coming with a sermon and communion, but just thanks for being with us. It's been a great day worshiping together. Let's go to those Zoom links now and continue to worship God today. Our theme in 2021 is simply one. And this is modeled after Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul speaks of one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And this month we're going to focus on the one body, otherwise known as the church. And as we study this vital topic, I just appeal to you, uh, to all of us, to view the church with a fresh set of eyes. And certainly the Holy Spirit has challenged us to do this during this pandemic, to see the church in a new way. And for our lesson today, for this week, as we study the one body, here's the question we're going to focus on. What's the cost of membership in this church? Come on, bro. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. That'll be our text for today, and I think we'll get an answer to our question from Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. What is the cost of membership in the church of Christ? And that's a very important question because when something is very expensive or if something is cheap. It completely changes the way we treat it. Now, several years ago, Amy and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary. We were living in Scotland at the time. Now we're way past 15 now, but thank you very much. The years continue to progress. We're working on 20. But we had our wedding anniversary several years ago. It was a special one because it was number 15 and we were living in Scotland at the time. We saved up our money because it was one of those years, 10, 15, 20. Those seemed to be uh, rather significant. So we saved our money and we were living in Scotland. 
we plan this big trip down south to London, and we wanted to see a West End show. Uh, for those in London and that part of the world, that's basically Broadway to them. So we saved our money. We wanted to see this West End show by the name of Hamilton. Wow. And we were able to get tickets. I, I waited online. I, I was there as soon as uh, the ticket opportunity opened up. I had my internet going. My page was open, and I jumped on. And we were able to get just these fabulous tickets to go see Hamilton. Uh, they were at least $120 per ticket. All right, and that, those aren't even for the best seats, but they were great seats to us. And we had a lovely lunch together in London. We had to pay to get train tickets down to London from Edinburgh, Scotland. Let's just say all together, our 15th wedding anniversary did cost us well over $400. Now, I share that with you because that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to us, Definitely. all right? But I don't regret it for a second, right? It was our 15th wedding anniversary. It was truly one of the best days of our lives. We remember it. We cherish it. It was the memory of a lifetime. We felt it was worth every penny that we spent. But what if, let's go back in time, what if, the week of the show, Amy had worked more than 50 hours. It was a longer work week for her. She was exhausted. And, and not only that, that same week, one of the kids caught a cold. Would we then skip the show? No. <laughs> not on your life. No way. I mean, we would find a way to win. We were invested. We would go to that show. Come hell or high water, we were going to go. We're gonna make it happen, why? Because we knew the show would be incredible. It was well worth the stress, well worth the self-denial, well worth the pain to get there. Plus, remember, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> but what if, another scenario, what if the morning of the show, we, we get in our taxi and, and we're heading over to the theater to see the show and we get stuck in horrific traffic? I mean, we're stuck. Uh, for hours in traffic, would we then just say, well, no, we're getting out of the taxi, we're going home now, we're done. Nope. No way. Nope. We would push through. We would push through because, of course, we're willing to wait for it. Right. Some of you understand that. But why? The, the show is just too expensive to miss. We have too much invested in this date. We're not going to miss it for the world. What if we double booked uh, after we bought the tickets, we realized, oh, no, it, it, it's my son Nate's birthday the same day. Sorry, Nate. We're still going. You know, what if Amy and I got into a big argument that morning? Doesn't matter. We're going to work through it because we're invested in this date. We're invested in this show. No matter the what ifs, only death or the return of Jesus would have prevented us from going on that date and seeing Hamilton that day in London. Here's my point. When something is expensive, when it costs us something big, it completely changes our mindset about it. And so with that in mind, how much is this church worth to you? What is the cost of membership for you in the church of Christ? If you're a member of this church, how much did it cost for you to be here today, to really be here in spirit? Let's begin to explore this question in Ephesians chapter one. We'll start reading in verse 15. What's the cost of membership? Ephesians 1 verse 15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking or I keep praying for you that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened 
in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And here it is. I pray that you know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for who? Well, God did this for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So here we have it in Ephesians chapter one. Paul begins in verse 15 by saying, for this very reason. And we're not going to read all of what happened before this, but what's the reason? What's he talking about? For this very reason. What reason? Well, if we back up to verses three through 14, we see it. The reason is this. All we have in Christ. All of what we've been given in Christ. No one here today has to be alone. In Christ, you and I are always chosen. No one in Christ is an orphan in this world. In Christ, you and I are adopted as sons and daughters. God's grace is lavished upon us. If we've been baptized into Christ, we've been given the Holy Spirit of God. And that's a deposit that guarantees your inheritance in heaven. That's it for that very reason. And that's why Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus. That's why he prays for us that we can capture how powerful, how majestic, how awesome of what he's saying really is. He prays, open the eyes of their heart, Lord. Just like the song that we sing sometimes. Open the eye, if our hearts could see, we want our hearts to see it. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord. He later prays in chapter three, verse 14. May we have power together with all the Christians, with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, high and deep is the love of Christ. So in summary, we must pray with passion to have a deeper understanding, a deeper appreciation for the immense treasures given to us in Christ by way of the church. So now let's zero in on chapter one, verses 19 through 22. Read those just a few moments ago. Ephesians 1, 19 through 22. Remember, if we go back in time a bit, Jesus boldly stated in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So here's the connection to that in verse 20 of Ephesians 1. God raised the body of Christ from the dead. So try as you may, you simply cannot kill the body of Christ. At the very top of the resume of Jesus, it reads, indestructible life. That's the power of God. And according to verse 20, it's the same power now given to each one of us in the church. We have resurrection power. So with that fact in mind, let's read again verses 22 and 23. It says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. Remember, the indestructible body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Here are the implications for this. The church now has become the indestructible body of Christ. That's what you've come to today. That's what you're a part of in Christ. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. If you're in the body of Christ, your destiny is bound with Jesus for eternal life. 
God has placed all of who we are. God has placed all of what we have at the feet of Jesus. If you've been baptized into the body of Christ, if you're spiritually connected to the body of Christ, you are a part of a body that simply cannot be killed. A body that cannot die. It's been proven. If you're in the church that belongs to Jesus, you've been given the gift of immortality. We could be immortals, right? I'd say that's a big deal. Amen. How much is immortality worth to you? How much does this cost? What is the cost of membership in the church of Christ? And we find our answer directly said here in chapter 2, verse 13. What's the cost? Chapter 2, verse 13. Let's read that. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing walls of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we have both access to the Father by the one spirit. So what is the cost of membership in the church? It's the blood of Christ. Amen. That's the cost. The blood of Jesus has paid for your membership in his church. Amen. And at the beginning of chapter two, if we walk this back, very familiar passage in the first nine verses of chapter two, we're reminded, and we need lots of reminding. We're forgetful people, Amen. Yeah. right? We're reminded of who we are, what we are, and where we would be going without Christ and his church. Right. All of us, even the best of us, are or were dead in our sins. In our sins, we're objects of wrath on the highway to hell. There's no sugarcoating that. But God is rich in mercy. Amen. Our God is a mercy millionaire. Amen. Like For Christians, God has made us alive in Christ. Because of great, God's great mercy, because of God's reckless love, each one of us has the opportunity to be saved from our sins. This is good news. This is the best news. This is a treasure. This is the highest price. What a gift. And then in verse 13, as we read just a moment ago, we see the price tag to, in essence, save us from ourselves. And I love the song that we sang just a few moments ago. It's hard to understand. It's hard to fathom. Sometimes we don't even want to think about it on a deeper level or it just becomes too familiar to us. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin on the cross. And then the response uh, we hope is here I am to worship. Here I am to worship Jesus, the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, everyone in this church, from the newest member to the oldest member, we all have equal access to the Father now, to the one spirit. From all the children here today that have been raised up in the church, who've been close to the truth, all the way to uh, us pagans who are very, very far away, we all come to the church in the same way, by the blood of Jesus. We all come into the body of Christ that way. We enter the church only at the cost of a man's life. And it's not just any man's life. We enter the church through the life of the Son of God. A man who died without sin and yet became sin for every one of us. What a treasure that is. So if you've forgotten, 
So if you don't know, now you know. This is an expensive church. Amen. What's your response to that? Today, I appeal to you, I challenge you, reflect on the cost of the church that Jesus built with his own blood and body. Remember, what something costs will change how you view it and how you treat it. Remember what I shared earlier about my expensive anniversary trip. We spent a lot of money. We had a lot invested, but nothing was going to stop us from making it happen. We were too far in. We were deeply invested. Now, I don't know much about cars, but I do know there's a big difference between a Ferrari and a Toyota Corolla. No insult to those with Toyota Corollas, I have one. With nearly 200,000 miles. It's just getting broken in. That's how I feel about Toyotas, all right? But I love Toyotas, but there's a big difference, okay? I mean, I don't know much about cars, but I, I treat a Ferrari much different than I would treat any Toyota, right? And the reason I share this is, in the same way, do you treat this church like you're driving around a Ferrari or a Toyota Corolla? Do you talk about this church like this church is a Ferrari or a Toyota Corolla? Do you invest your time, your money, your resources in building this church like it's a Ferrari or an old beat up Toyota Corolla? And I'll take this metaphor another step here. Just think about if you've had the opportunity to drive someone else's car and it's much more expensive than yours. What if you, you, you borrowed someone's car, it's new, it's, it's expensive. I, I know for me, if I'm driving someone else's car, all right, and a trust has been given to me, I get nervous. Uh, it, it, it smells new, that new car smell. I don't know if I've ever experienced that. We always buy used cars, but that's a whole other thing. But you got that great new car smell, you treat it well, you don't want to spill anything. I keep it clean. I don't abuse it. I learn to drive it properly. I know what it costs, or at least I have a good idea of what that car costs. I don't want to damage it because I know I don't have the money to fix it if I break it. It's not within my power to fix it, so I'm certainly not going to break it. I say that to help us here do you view the church of Jesus with the same respect? When push comes to shove, will you protect the integrity and reputation of the church? Or are you quick to take, take the church for granted? Would you be quick to throw mud on the bride, mud on the wedding dress of the bride of Christ? You know, I mean, maybe some of us who here maybe has had gotten a new car in the last couple of years or a, a pre-owned car. We used to call them used cars. Now it's pre-owned. That sounds so much better. But yeah, yeah, you know how it is. Like if you've gotten a car recently, especially a brand new car. All right. It's pretty cool. The first couple of months, maybe even the first few years. But the newness wears off, doesn't it? That's just life. Anything you get, the newness wears off. Because once it's your car, it becomes normal. You forget how special it was to get the car. You forget the sacrifices that were made to have that car. Uh, even if it was an old clunker, you know, when you first got it, you're like, man, I'm just thankful to get a car. You forget how grateful you were. You begin to take it for granted. And it's it can be the same way with Christ in the church. We have to be cautious. We have to know ourselves. I think we can forget how much this church costs. 
We may remember Jesus each week in communion, and I think we definitely need to do that, but sometimes we can forget uh, to connect the cross with the gift of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Many of us here in the body of Christ. And I know because this can be me. We can act sometimes like what we have together is no big deal. It stops becoming holy. It, it, it becomes something too ordinary, too casual. Or even we can get to the place where you feel like the church owes me something. Or I deserve this and that from the church. We can miss time with the church for the smallest reasons or excuses. We can walk around grumpy. We can easily get uh, critical of those leading us. Yes, they're going to sin. They're going to make mistakes or we're going to disagree. But we can be grumpy very easily about the church. Or we can have a glass chin and get easily hurt or offended by the church or people in the church. And I'm telling you, all these things easily happen when we forget the price that was paid for the church that we've been given. The price of the body and the blood of Jesus. And that's, I believe that's exactly why Jesus calls the church his body. You ever wonder why those are synonymous? Why those are the same terms? I think the name helps us remember. The body of Christ was killed and raised from the dead so that we then could become the body of Christ. So I encourage you today, if you're not yet a Christian, young, old, and everything in between, if you're not yet a Christian, or maybe you've faded away from the faith that you once had, I encourage you to count the cost of what it takes to follow Jesus. I think that's important. I think that's responsible. Be urgent to follow Jesus, but also count the cost of what you're getting into. And it will take up giving everything that's most dear and beloved by you, trusting Jesus and laying those things at his feet. But trust me, no matter the cost, no matter what you give up, it pales in comparison to what Jesus has given you, just giving you the opportunity to become a Christian. You want to count the cost? Your price for membership in this church has already been paid. You just need to sign up and commit to it. It's it's not so much about what it will cost you. It's all about understanding what it cost Jesus. Please, I encourage you, what are you waiting for? Tomorrow's not guaranteed. If you're here in the audience, if you're listening at home, thank you for listening. But make a decision. Ask someone here to study the Bible with you today. You can do this. The man who wrote the words we're reading today tried to destroy the church early in his life, the Apostle Paul. But he made it. And now he's teaching us through the Holy Spirit about the gift of the church. The mercy millionaire God wants nothing more than to give you all of his riches in Christ. In the beginning of Ephesians 2, in verses 5 and 8, very important to understand this. Paul writes, it is by grace you have been saved. And I think a lot of us, we may not admit, we kind of have this love-hate relationship with grace. We can pull out the grace card sometimes when it's convenient. Uh, Other times, if we really study it out, it can be quite scary to us to know the implications of this grace. We want grace, but we need to give grace as well. But it's by grace you have been saved. And If you think about it, you and I are offered so many free things by way of the church. The church has given us grace upon grace upon grace in each one of our lives. Guest speakers, singles events, weekly lessons, parenting workshops. Go around your neighborhood. I don't think people in your neighborhood are getting these things for free. Uh, Parenting help. Marriage counseling, leadership training, 
99% of the time, these are all free by the grace of the church. There's no charge, thank God, for midweek classes. No charge for family group fellowship or family group leaders planning out things for us and loving us and serving us in that way. There's no charge for the built-in friendships that we can have with one another in the church. There, no one in this church charges for the expert advice that's all around us. And yet these things I just mentioned, including advice, it's almost as if sometimes we can feel that I'm having to pay for it and, and, and getting these things is like paying a mortgage when it's actually been given to us. It's a gift. It's all free. But when it's free, here's the thing. When, as we said earlier, when something's free, if we don't have the right perspective, it suddenly somehow becomes less valuable. Right? If something was cheap or it was free, or we view it that way, or we, it, it, we've had it a long time, the newness wears off, it becomes less valuable or even disposable or dare, dare I say despisable or despised by us at times. I think many times we can get, it's hard to get motivated when we get free stuff. Maybe I'll take time for it. Maybe I'll go, maybe I won't. Let's see, marriage advice, hmm, I'll skip that. It'll always be there for me when I need it. Uh, another Zoom midweek, uh, I'm tired. It's free, but yeah, that means there's always going to be another one I can just catch on next week. That's how we can become when we forget the price that was paid for what we have. And if we have children, they're watching us. <laughs> they know what's most important to us. They have our number. And they'll know if this church is the greatest treasure we have or if it's just lumped in with everything else like school, sports, or entertainment is by grace we have been saved. If grace does not motivate you, if grace does not excite you and me, we're in trouble. We got to get that back. Hebrews 10, 29 warns us, do not trample on the Son of God. Do not trample him underfoot. In Hebrews 10, 29, do not treat the blood of Christ as though it was something common to man. Never, ever insult the spirit of God's grace. If you do this, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Judgment is coming. It's by grace we have been saved. It's by grace that we've been given the body of Christ. That's the cost. Grace, the blood of Christ, the body of Christ. You cannot pay the admission to this church. It's been paid for you already by the blood of Jesus. So as we close here and we prepare to take communion, I just would encourage us to respond to this, to reflect on the cost that was paid for you to be in the church. And if you're not yet a Christian, your admission's already been paid. We, you just need to commit yourself and sign up for it. It's the greatest gift you could ever receive. When you sit there and think, should I become a Christian or not? Remember the price has been paid for you. When you sit there and think, should I serve this church in greater ways this year? Should I commit myself? Should I make myself vulnerable here and give of myself, even though I'm tired, I'm exhausted, it's been a rough year. Should I continue to serve? Should I serve in greater ways again? Think about the price that's been paid by Jesus. Should I commit to this church more than Sundays or not? Should I submit to the leadership of this church or not? Should I stay? Should I go? This is too hard. It's going to cost me too much. No. The price has already been paid in the body and blood of Jesus. So as we prepare to remember and celebrate Jesus today in communion, I think Paul answered the question for us. This is an expensive church. I pray that the blood of Jesus 
will compel you to change the way you view this church. Because I believe our best days as Christians, our best days as a church are right in front of us. Let's bow our heads in prayer and give honor to Jesus. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time of communion together. Thank you for your plan, the demonstration of your love, a plan that we would never have come up with on our own. Thank you that you are the creator that died for his creation. Thank you that you are the judge that took the judgment. Thank you that you've taken our sin and become sin for us in Jesus. Father, I pray that you help us in greater ways, each one of us, to understand and reflect on the glory of your church. We know it's made up of people and people that sin, and yet in your eyes, because of Jesus, we're perfection. We thank you, God, that we're part of something that's immortal. We thank you for Jesus going to the cross, dying, but even more so, showing us the way to eternal life. Thank you that the grave simply could not keep him down. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the life that we have now. Fill our hearts full of supernatural gratitude uh, through your Holy Spirit that lives in so many of us. Thank you for the body of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Uh, as the song says, we never will truly know how much it costs. Uh, to see Jesus on the cross for our sins. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for this time together. Change our hearts, mold our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.